Good morning from the Fort Bragg Seventh-day Adventist Church on this wonderful Sabbath. We welcome all those that have tuned in to us and we're doing part two of the sanctuary series that we're starting on and the Lord willing next week will be part three and at that time we'll be getting into the time of the early church when our church was founded and all that happened during those amazing years of the pioneers of this church and when our church was founded just after 1844. So today we have part two and when we do this let's all remember and uh, that we're talking about Jesus who is in the sanctuary in heaven looking down on us from above hoping against hope that we'll choose him in this great controversy. I'd like to point out starting here with a verse from Psalms 14 which really is in the major pillar in this series. It starts off verse 1 from Psalms 14, only a fool has said in his heart there is no God. And then it goes on in verse 2, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. That's only one verse of many in the scriptures where it gives this concept that the Lord is up there in his high and holy place in the sanctuary of heaven looking down on the earth to all the billions and perhaps trillions of other planets he's focused on this one because this is where the great controversy is being played out and he's so interested in each one of us and whether we like it or not whether we know it or not each of us are part of the great controversy between Christ and Satan we're all part of that great controversy so I'd like to then start this morning with reading Mark 2, 1 to 12. But before we do that, we're going to ask the Lord to be with us. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can be here this morning on this Sabbath, this wonderful day, worshiping you in this sanctuary. Lord, guide our thoughts today. May it glorify you and you alone. Help us as we contemplate this subject that's so important to us in these latter days, that we will understand that you are our advocate, our lawyer, you're our judge. You have everything you've given us so that we can win the battle between Christ and Satan and be with Jesus forevermore in that blessed land to come. We ask this this morning in the name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. So we start off in Mark 2, 1 to 12 this morning. Very fascinating story from Scripture. And again he entered, quoting now, and again he entered into Capernaum after seven days, and it was noised that he was in the house. The blessed King James Version, he was, it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room for, to receive them, and not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born before. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up and let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Amazing, thy son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Where there is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. Which is easier? But, they, but that they may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Now here Jesus refers to himself not as the Son of God, but as the Son of Man. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up the bed, and go thy way into thy house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth from before them all, insomuch they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. We never saw it on this fashion. Again, these beautiful words from the King James Bible. We never saw it on this fashion. So forgiveness of sin... What a truth of salvation we have here. 
God has placed into every soul born on this earth the desire to know him and trust him. But Satan has but a short time to prove God wrong in the great controversy. So he's going about, as the scripture tells us, as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. At this point, we remember the two verses of scripture, one in John 1, 9, where it says when everybody's born, there's something placed in their soul, in their mind, something God puts there that they will seek after him. This is also brought out by Solomon in Ecclesiastes, where it says that there's a something that's placed in the mind of people that they will search God, coordinating that with John 1, 9. Right in the beginning, we have some wonderful truths in the scripture that we have just read. Jesus called him son before he forgave him. This reminds us of the promise from Jesus. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The second is, says that Jesus saw their faith and he said, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. When Jesus saw their faith, he acted. Jesus can always cut right through the superficial and right to the point and the motive of any given issue. He perceived that the Pharisees were reasoning in their minds that this man speaks blasphemy. This man speaks blasphemy, they said. Then he asked them a question that left these religious leaders absolutely speechless. Is it easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, said Jesus, or to say, take up thy bed and walk? At this point, giving them evidence that he was God, but they still rejected him. And the people and the bystanders that were likewise nearly speechless, saying, we never saw it like this. We never saw it on this fashion. We never saw it on this fashion. So at this point in the discussion, I would like to go to an old book that I treasure, have in my library. A book written of all people by James White. James White himself, published in 1906, and obviously written many years before the publishing of 1906. This chapter in that book is called The Judgment. Now they didn't have everything completely worked out at that point in time, but they certainly had the, the basics of the sanctuary worked out by that time, at least for the most part. But I'd like to share a few paragraphs with you from this um, chapter on the judgment written by James White, one of the major founders of our church back in the 1844 time period. So quoting now, for nearly 6,000 years of sin, this world has stood as a dark blot in the universe of God. And yet through it all, the light of his mercy has shone clear and bright and the work of redemption has gone steadily forward. And when this work shall be finished, there will have been gathered from the dwellers of all the ages a host of those who have been true to God and shall people this earth according to the original plan of the Creator. Remember, Revelation tells us there'll be a number that no man can number. James White refers to it as a host here. The word host implies a lot of people. When the warfare between good and evil is ended, he writes, the sharpest line of demarcation will be drawn between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. This will be a clean world with the stains of sin and the blood of sinners forever removed. Taken from Malachi 3.18. It is therefore evident that a time must come when the cases of all who have lived shall come in review and their future destiny be finally settled. This is a time of judgment so many times mentioned in the word of God. Paul says that we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Romans 14, 10. This judgment will not be arbitrary. The God of heaven knows the character of every human being. When his life work is ended, he should pass upon his future for weal or woe without the formalities of a future judgment. But the evil outcome of sin must be complete as an object lesson to unfallen worlds. God's righteousness has been called in question by Satan. It must be revealed in the closing up of this world's history. Throughout the ages of eternity, God's justice and mercy is manifested in his dealings with Satan and sinners, must stand vindicated. Hence, the final judgment will be very real and its scenes hosts of heavenly angels and the redeemed of earth will participate. On this great day we read that God, quoting now, hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, meaning Jesus himself, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men 
in that he raised him up from the dead, Acts 17, 31. The judgment cannot therefore take place at the death of each individual as some suppose, for a day or set time has been fixed when this work shall be undertaken. And Paul in his powerful, art, powerful argument before Felix, quoting him, reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, quote unquote, Acts 24, 25. Hence, in the days of Paul, the judgment had not taken place yet, nor was it then in session. Referring back to the term, the judgment to come. In order that the investigations of the judgment may be unquestioned and complete, the lives of all men and women are written in the books of heaven. From the records found in these books will be the future of all who have lived on this earth, and it will be decided. Concerning the books of record and the throngs that take part in this great happening, we read, thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set, writes Daniel, and the books were opened, Daniel 7, 10. Of the fate of the millions who have lived and died, John writes, quoting, And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books, according to their works. Revelation 20, 12. In the foregoing text references made to the book of life, this is the Christian, to the Christian is the most important volume of all the universe of God. It is the roster of all the faithful of all the ages. In it is written the names of all who have undertaken the service of God. No other names are entered upon its pages. Day by day the guardian angels bears to heaven the record of those whose names are written in the book. Their sins are recorded on the debit side. As sins are confessed and wrongs made right, pardon is written opposite to transgression. And so the life record grows. Happy is the mortal whose debits of sin are balanced by the pardons of forgiveness. Awful is the fate of him who starts in the service of God but falters in his course. For him the record on the book of life will not be clear. The debit side will not be balanced by the pardons on the credit side. The names of such will be blotted out of the book of life in God's great judgment day. Although our names may be once written in the book of life, they may in the day of judgment be stricken from its pages. Of the one who does not continue in well-doing, John writes, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city from the things which are written in this book. Only those whose names are retained in the book of life can enter the gates of the new Jerusalem. Quoting now from Revelation 21, There shall in no wise enter into the new Jerusalem anything that defileth, neither whosoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life, Revelation 22, I'm sorry, 21, 27. The names of all the overcomers will be retained in this wonderful book. Quoting now again Revelation 3, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before the angels. So says Jesus himself. From the foregoing it will be seen that the judgment for which the book of life is the basis has to do only with those who have undertaken the service of God, have called themselves Christians. This investigative judgment must take place before Jesus comes, for it is coming. He brings the reward for the overcomers and fulfills all the promises made to them. Hence their cases must then have been decided at that time. Of the great final reward our Lord has sent us word through the prophet John quoting John now, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelation 22, 12. The righteous receive their reward when Jesus comes, and their judgment takes place first, while that of the wicked takes place at a later period. Hence Peter, in prophetic view of the consummation of the Christian hope, exclaims, quoting Peter now, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. If he first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Peter wrote in that in 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. John, however, viewing this same scene, writes, quoting, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints. 
and them that fear thy name, small and great. Revelation 8, 11, 18. By the way, the word saint, remember, just means you've been set apart for a holy purpose. It doesn't mean you're some special type of Christian. The foregoing texts have to do with the judgment and the reward of the saints. It takes place during the last days of anger, strife, and commotion among the nations of the earth. It is the investigative judgment of all the dead who have ever started in the service of God and will determine who have been overcomers in the warfare with sin and Satan. The cases of the living righteous will come up for review as probation ceases. When completed, the fiat will go forth. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Revelation 22, 11. The day of repentance are past. The righteous are sealed for the kingdom of God and the judgment of the wicked will follow to determine what their punishment shall be. The next event is the coming of the Lord from heaven. The text proceeds quickly to say this, and behold, I come quickly, verse 12. The cases of all the righteous have been settled. Jesus comes to earth, the righteous dead are raised, the living who are tried and true are changed, and all are caught up in the clouds in the air, and wing their way to the new Jerusalem, to the home of God. The Apostle Paul loved to dwell upon these scenes of the triumph of the saints. He writes these famous words from Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever, ever be with the Lord. There will be two resurrections. The first is of the righteous when Christ comes, of which John writes, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in that first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. Revelation 26. The second resurrection is of all the wicked of all the ages, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This positively implies that at the end of the thousand years the wicked will be raised to life. During this thousand years, the righteous will be in the courts of heaven, engaged with the Father, the Son, and the myriads of holy angels in the judgment of the wicked and fallen angels. We read, quoting now, And I saw thrones, and they, the saints, sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 4. This thousand years of judgment covers the period between the two resurrections, that of the righteous, unfortunately that of the wicked. The saints have a prominent part to act in the judgment of the wicked. In Daniel's vision of the future of God's people, we saw the time when judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom, Daniel 7, 22. And Paul, in reproving those of the Corinthian church who went to law against the brethren, writes, quoting, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that ye shall judge angels, angels who have sinned and were driven out of heaven? How much more things that pertain to this life? 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. In the end of the thousand years, at the conclusion of the judgment of the wicked, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, Revelation 21, 2, to become the capital city, the capital city of the new earth. Then the wicked dead are raised and come up around the city. And then from his throne, high and lifted up, the great judge, the Son of God, to whom the Father has committed all judgment, John 5, 22, announces the decisions of the heavenly court. First arresting those upon his right hand in position of favor, that is inside the city, he says, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew 25, 34. And turning to those outside the city, he utters the fearful sentence with tears in his eyes. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Unquote. Matthew 25, 41. Then follows the execution of the sentence. Filled with madness, the wicked array themselves against the city as though to take it by force. The prophetic record of the scene is presented to John in vision, says, and they went up, quoting now, and they went up on the breadth of the earth, encompassed the city, 
and camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and just devoured them. Revelation 20 verse 9. This is the second death spoken of in Revelation 20 verse 6. But of the righteous it is written, when the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it, Psalms 37, 34. Quoting another verse from Malachi, but of the righteous it is written, when the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it, unto you that fear my name, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Ye shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. Ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts from Malachi 4. Then I believe he quotes a song of the day, Then, O Lord, prepare my soul for that great day. O wash me in thy precious blood, and take my sins away. We next segment here, we're going to go to a modern writing from Angel Rodriguez. Angel Rodriguez is a giant theologian in our church. He's retired now, but he's still very active. He'll, he'll write for various publications and answer technical theological questions in a most remarkable, charming way. Uh, he uh, has written about sin, and I thought it would be good for us to delve into this a little bit, just for a few moments, what sin really is. What sin really is. Somebody questioned him, and so this is the result of this question. They wrote in, there is some debate in my church about the nature of sin. Could you share with us the biblical perspective of the sin topic? Well, he did that, and it was just written up in one of our publications, and so I'd like to share it with you briefly. There's about four paragraphs here. He writes, quoting, for our purpose, sin is the ethical, moral, mental, and spiritual decompensation of the human being. Originally created in the image of God, Genesis 1.26, Decompensation is about being involved in the process of spiritual putrefaction that upon progression results in the disintegration, disintegration of God's good creation. The process leaves behind spiritual and moral repulsiveness to the Lord. This concept of sin understood as the dissolution of our inner being and our wholeness helps us to realize that it is already active within us and that it is much more than a thought or an action. Then he goes on with this paragraph, sin is rebellion and enslavement and alienation. Sin is indeed an enslaving power, Romans 6:17, one that we have voluntarily embraced in an act of rebellion against God, Genesis 3, 1 to 7. In its original manifestation, sin was an incomprehensible act of rebellion against the good creator, but it immediately became a permanent disrupting and destructive inner attitude expressing itself in all sorts of evil thoughts, words, and actions. To be a sinner is to be characterized indeed, defined by a state of inner conflict against God, against others, and against self, Romans 8:7. And James 4, 4, if sin is a state of rebellion against God, then it is also a state of alienation from him, the very source of life. And sinners are, in fact, heading inexorably to extinction. Rebellion creates distance, separation, and it implies independence. Death, the decompensation we mentioned above, is almost by definition separation of a condition of animosity against God. Such alienation shows itself in sinful behavior. So hang in there with me, this is a little heavy, but just a couple more paragraphs. Most of the time we conceive of sin as a serious behavior problem, and this is correct. In fact, the Bible states that sin is a violation of the law. The Bible emphasizes wicked behavior in its portrait of sin because actions reveal the inner condition of the human being. They are the objective evidence of the state of the human heart as a corrupted center of existence. Jesus stated in un forgettable terms, for it is from within, Jesus writes, out of a person's heart that the evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slender, and arrogance, and folly, Mark 7, 21. There is something deeply wrong with humans. There is rottenness at the very core of our existence. This is hard for us to understand sometimes. Isaiah, though, had it right, didn't he? He said our righteousness, our very righteousness that we do for God is filthy rags. Our, the very good things we do has a little mixture of self in it or something that isn't quite right. 
So our righteousness is filthy rags, writes Isaiah. There's something deeply wrong with us. An understanding of sin is a behavior problem. It's hardly adequate to reveal the deep darkness of the human predicament. Then we have this line that we should never forget. Quoting now, a limited understanding of the human condition leads to a limited comprehension of the costliness of the sacrificial death of the Son of God. I just must repeat that. A limited understanding of the human condition leads to a limited comprehension of the costliness of the sacrificial death of the Son of God. Then we have the final paragraph, resolution of the sin problem. The final solution to the problem of sin is not behavior modification, even if it occurs through the power of the Spirit, but death. Christ died a most awful death separated from the Father, Matthew 27, 46. The corrupted human nature is not to be patched up, but is to be destroyed. It was executed on the cross of Christ. What he required was nothing less than a new birth, John 3, 5, a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, brought into existence through the power of his resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. We, for now we struggle in a world of sin, but at the coming of Christ, our sinful nature will be removed and we'll be dressed with incorruptibility. So writes Professor Rodriguez. God, I'm going back now to uh, some good news. God can never forgive sin. He never did forgive sin, he never can forgive sin. He only forgives sinners. If he could forgive sin, Christ would not have had to die. He would not have had to come into this world to the cross. For you see, God has spoken, saying, I change not. Malachi 3.6 tells us, for I am the Lord, I change not. God's law is eternal and immutable. He cannot change it. That is why Jesus came to die. Everyone born since Adam and Eve are sinners. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me, Psalms 51, 5. Jeremiah also chimes in, 17 verse 9 says, the heart is deceitfully wicked and who can know it? Then we have 1 John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Isaiah 6, 5 tells us, woe is me for I'm a man of unclean lips. 1 John 1, 9 says, now if we confess our sins, here's the good news. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In the judgment bar of heaven, God looks at us and sees Jesus and not me. He sees holiness and purity and perfection and righteousness. These do not belong to me, but they are attributed to me. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What does God do with our sins? What has he promised? There's a wonderful, refreshing, encouraging theme throughout scripture about what God with, does with our sins. Let us take a look at these promises and guarantees from God. And all this is happening in the sanctuary above where Jesus dwells. These promises should make us cry out for joy. They should make our heart to sing, said one, and our feet to dance. God does us word pictures in the scriptures, parable-like stories, so that we can understand more clearly with our human minds. From Isaiah 43, 25, we have these beautiful words, I, even I am he that blotteth out thy transgression for mine own sake, and I will not remember thy sins. Isn't that amazing? He said, for mine own sake. God has given us everything possible to win the battle of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Then he tells us that it's for my own sake that I've done this. Going to Jeremiah 31, 34, for I will forgive their iniquity, I will remember their sins no more. What more blessed thing could you have going away this morning than that? I will remember your sin no more. Then we have Psalms 85, 2, thou hast covered all their sin. Then we come to Isaiah 38, 17. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Have you ever tried to see behind your back? He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us, says Micah 7, 19. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. 
Psalms 103.12, David writes, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. Then Isaiah 44.22, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Here's the appeal, return unto me, says Jesus, for I have redeemed thee. Romans 8, Paul writes to encourage us even more, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation, really, Lord? It's what I said, yes, no condemnation. Let us take these a little more in depth, one at a time. Isaiah tells us he blots out our sins and does not remember them for his sake. For mine own sake, God writes. What a beautiful thought. He wants us to be with him where he is. How loving and tender is this promise to us. There was a mother telling her little girl that God can do anything. No, mommy. There's one thing God cannot do, she said. No, my child, that is wrong. God can do everything. No, mommy, I'm right. God cannot remember my sins. She was told that in Sabbath school that morning. What a beautiful truth Jeremiah recorded thousands of years ago. I will remember their sin no more. The next one is like we would have a perfectly white piece of paper. There's a huge black spot on it. Then you put on a certain chemical agent and the black disappears, leaving a spotless white paper. David tells us God has covered all our sins forever. Isaiah assures us that God puts all our sins behind his back. He cannot see them there. Our sins cannot be seen by us because God is between us and our sin. God cannot see them because they are behind his back. God is so wonderful. He talks to us in parables and stories that we can understand clearly. What a picture for our minds to grasp. He puts our sins behind his back. You've probably been in an airplane at 44,000 feet above the earth looking down like I have many times. You cannot see the earth or the sky because it's perfectly white blanket of clouds obstructing your view of the earth and the ocean. This is what Isaiah says, I've blotted out your sins like a thick cloud. What a fantastic truth the next one is. If you start on a trip going around the world, you start going west and east is halfway around the world. The farther you go west, the east are still half a world away. East can never catch up with west. God, again, gives us a word picture, a parable of sorts. Our sins are as far as the east is from the west. What a beautiful promise. We have one of these ultimate texts from Isaiah. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What could be more descriptive? What greater promise could we even want? The question comes up because of our human nature. Do we really believe we've been forgiven? That's our challenge. Do we really, really believe it? Our sins, some of them so black that they cannot be forgiven? Well, Jesus answered that question by saying, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Are you going to doubt Jesus' words? We shouldn't. Matthew 12, 31, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But it also plainly says in that, that text that sin against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven. Well, what does that mean? In the past, I've struggled with that at times. What does it really mean? And one day, a godly minister friend of mine taught me that this simply means that if I reject Jesus and I reject the Holy Spirit pleading with my heart to accept him as my Savior, then I, by that action, condemn myself like Saul and like Judas, condemned themselves by rejecting the Holy Spirit, pleading with them that they would be lost if they followed the course of action. The Holy Spirit pled with them. Also, a sin against the Holy Spirit means a sin you do not ask forgiveness for. Really simple. Now, that really makes sense to me. Now, if we do not accept these promises of God that we have reviewed, we make him out to be a liar. Our sins will not determine our salvation. Neither will our good works determine our salvation. Is what we do with Jesus and the Holy Spirit pleading with us that makes the difference. Let us take the example of a missionary who's perhaps worked for 50 years in a mission field under great hardships. Perhaps part of his family died out there and he kept on working for his master. And we contrast that with the thief on the cross who knew Jesus for just a few minutes before he died. You see, God's way of looking at things is different than our way because both of these individuals be sitting at the same banquet table of Revelation 14 in heaven. 
both of them will be there. The th 10 minutes who knew Jesus before he died, if it was that short of the thief, and the missionary that spent 50 years in the mission field. They both go to the same heaven. From a heart full of love for what Jesus did for me, I will respond. I will have no choice but to do so, respond or reject it. There's no room for license to sin here. As we understand clearly Jesus' sacrifice for us, we want to serve him with all our heart and our motives will be right and pure. Someone says, well, I don't really feel forgiven. Have you ever felt that way? Let us say that a wealthy person gave you a large check. Suppose it was for $10,000 and I go to the bank, but that day I feel sick, I feel terrible, I just was diagnosed with pneumonia, I have 104 temperature, I'm really sick and I'm beginning to get chest pain and think I'm having a heart attack. I feel the worst that I've ever felt in my whole lifetime, but I still have a check for $1,000. 10,000 if you will, and that check is good. How I feel does not change the fact that I have that check. So likewise, God's promises that we have read this morning are there for us to hold on to no matter how we feel. Someone has said it this way, be my feelings what they will, Jesus is my savior still. So likewise, God's promises that we have read this morning are there for us to hold on to no matter how we feel. Be my feelings what they will. Jesus is my Savior still. So these words speak for themselves. This is the way we often think, but not the way God thinks. Jesus clearly defined the principles involved with, this, with the parable. A man owed his king a million dollars. The king demanded payment. The man could not pay and said, please have mercy on me, forgive me. The king's heart softened to him and forgave him the entire debt. But... Alas, this man went out and found a man who owed him a dollar, demanded payment immediately, and when he could not pay, he cast him into prison. Friends told the king what had happened, and the king took the ungrateful servant out and cast him out into prison until he could pay his entire debt. Jesus said it clearly, in very truth, anyone who gives heed to what I say and puts his trust in him who has sent me has eternal life and does not come up for judgment but has already passed from death into life. So let us review one more time. Isaiah says he will blot out our sins and remember them no more. Jeremiah says he will forgive iniquity and remember our sins no more. David says God has covered all of our sins. Isaiah tells us our sins will be put behind God's back. Isaiah also says he will blot out our sins like a thick cloud. Micah says our sin will be cast into the depth of the sea. John says if we confess our sins, God will forgive them. Isaiah also says this beautiful text, if they're like scarlet, they will be as snow. If they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Jesus in the Lord's Prayer, we never need to forget this, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus hit the button right there really hard, didn't he? Forgive our debts. He forgives us as we forgive others. Paul reminds us, forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you, Colossians 3.13. So I have three questions. Would you really like to please God? Would you like to be blessed? Would you like to have perfect peace? The answer comes from Isaiah that he blots out our sins for his sake, for mine own sake. God writes. This tells us that God wants us to be with him where he is. He wants to save us from this world of sin. The beautiful text from Psalms 32 1, it says it so beautifully. Blessed is he, blessed is he whose sin is forgiven. What on earth is like that? that that's not an earthly phenomenon, that's a heavenly thing. Blessed is he whose sin is forgiven. So when we ask for forgiveness of our sin, God adds his blessing to us. Then from Isaiah 26, 3, when that happens, Isaiah writes, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Perfect peace? Oh, don't we long for that perfect peace? So would you like to have perfect peace? There is a promise of receiving perfect peace. What more could we want? to have our sins blotted out, to please God, to be blessed of God by asking forgiveness, we will have perfect peace. 
Within our busy lives, we all have to do. We must take time to be with Jesus daily. David had the secret so many thousands of years ago in Psalms 119.11, quoting, Now thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And Jesus, when he visited Mary and Martha some 2,000 years ago, also had the answer by saying, there's only one thing needful, and that's sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words. This is what he told Martha and Mary, with Mary sitting at his feet that day. One thing is needful, so that we all welcome our Savior when he comes, and we will have great joy of going to heaven with him when he comes. The man and woman God has promised to forget is the man or woman we used to be before we knew Jesus. I close now with a few pungent quotes from, this one is from the Amazing Grace book. Listen to these incredible words. The church of God below, are you with me? The church of God below is one with the church of God above. Believers on the earth and the beings in heaven who have never fallen constitute one church. Now, when have you last heard that concept? Every heavenly angel is interested in the assemblies of the saints who on earth meet to worship God. In the inner court of heaven, they listen to the testimony, the witnesses for Christ, and they praise the worshipers below. While angels drink from the fountainhead, the saints on earth drink of the same pure streams flowing from the throne of God, the streams that make glad the city of our God. Oh, that we could all realize the nearness of heaven to earth. Oh my. In every assembly of the saints below are angels of God. So when we walk into this church and any church on this earth, whether it's under a tree in Africa before Maranatha comes or wherever that church is, angels are there. Angels are there. Further closing, not a sigh is breathed, not a pain felt, not a grief pierces the soul, but the throb vibrates to the Father's heart. So when you're distraught, you have troubles piled upon troubles, remember, not a sigh of is breathed, not a pain felt, not a grief pierces a soul, but the throb vibrates to the Father's heart. Desire of Ages 356. Then linking our comments today with what's happening in the sanctuary above where Jesus is pleading for us. The Bible shows us God in his high and holy place, not in a state of inactivity, not in silence and solitude, but surrounded by 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of holy angels, all waiting to do his will. Through channels which we cannot discern, he is in active communication with every part of his dominion. But it is to this speck of the world and the souls that he gave his only begotten son to save, that his interest and interest of all heaven is centered. On this tiny planet, you know, we're one of the smallest planets in the universe, you know that, don't you? God is bending from his throne to hear the cry of the oppressed to every sincere prayer he answers. Here am I, Christian. He uplifts the distressed and the downtrodden. In all our afflictions, he is afflicted in every temptation, every trial. The angel of his presence is near to deliver. Not a sparrow falls to the ground that he does not notice. We end with these words. Jesus continues, as you confess me before men, so will I confess you before God and the holy angels. The Father, as he looks down on us, beholds not your faulty character, but he sees you as clothed in my perfection, says Jesus. He sees us as clothed in that white robe of righteousness. So we'll close with prayer at this time. Give us wisdom, Lord. Give us wisdom as we study and understand the scriptures. Help us to take time with God each day so that we may plan for eternity and learn to know Jesus as our personal Savior. The earth is old and crumbling. Jesus is coming. May we learn to know our Master so well that when he comes in the clouds of heaven, we can look up and say, Lo, this is my God. I've waited for him, and he will save me. In the name of our Savior. We ask, amen.